All right. Hello, traders. This is James dealing with Daily Effects. Just want to say thank you very much for your time in advance. It's January 21st, and it's still kind of quiet out there. <laughs> Uh, now, we do have a couple of items of interest on the calendar for tomorrow, uh, specifically out of Canada. We have Canadian CPI tomorrow morning, 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time, 10 o'clock. It's just an hour and a half after that CPI print. Get Bank of Canada. So there's the potential for some volatility there, but it's worth noting that it's been pretty quiet of late. And we had talked about this on Thursday, and it's pretty much the same theme today where a lot of what we're looking at is tightening ranges or digestion. Uh, case in point here in dollar CAD, which I wanted to look at as the focus chart for today. Over the last week, it's basically been confined to like a 65 pip range. Resistance coming in off that 3080 level that we looked at previously, support holding in above 3025, which come in as a swing low just a couple of weeks ago or a week and a half ago. Look at this on the daily and it is basically just a band box where this thing is waiting to break in one direction or the other. Now, I think the dangerous aspect of this going into tomorrow, where there are two drivers that are going to be coming into the spotlight very, very near each other, is the potential for a break in one direction to be followed by a reversal or a fade in the other direction. One of those items where we do have price action pulled back like a rubber band just waiting to break, and perhaps that CPI print brings in some CAD weakness or even some CAD strength. But then the following rate decision, again, just an hour and a half later, reverses that move and then some based on what the Bank of Canada is looking at, how aggressive they're looking to mold policy in 2020. It's their first rate decision of the new year. So it really does come off as extremely unpredictable. But this is very much symptomatic of what's been going on in FX as a whole. Like, for instance, if we look at the US dollar, after ending last year with some fairly attractive short side trend, so far in January, we've basically just been clawing all of that back. I mean, as a matter of fact, if we go to like a four hour chart, you can see about over the past month, we're pretty much looking at a net of zero. And that's even with a, a pretty visible downside run into the end of last year, followed by the last three weeks in which buyers have just been clawing back the majority of that move. So in dollar CAD for tomorrow, like I said, two drivers, uh, it could get pretty slippery out there, especially given that we are in such a tight, tight, small range. Um, but there is some reference to look at going into that, that, that dual driver backdrop. And key would be a breach of short term support for a longer term support level to come into play that may be able to hold through the Bank of Canada rate decision or vice versa if some CAD weakness can flow into the mix around that CPI report, maybe looking for a hold of resistance at a key level going into that Bank of Canada rate decision, at which point swing trade potential remains. Uh, now on the resistance side of the coin, there's a really very visible level around 13102. This is a level we looked at in the past. It helped to offer a swing low here in December, mid-December, just before that short side move really built in. This is also what's helping to mark the January swing high. Came into play just about a week and a half ago. It's right around 3102. Now, near-term resistance is coming in around 3080. So if we do get that top side break through 3080 with the follow-through hold at 3102, that door could remain open for short side strategies for those looking to swing this thing right back down. A little bit higher on the chart is another potential resistance zone that runs between 3132 to 3150. And then above that, I'm looking at this as the R3 zone. This runs between around 3180 up to around 3205. A top side break through 3205 is going to make it very difficult to, to substantiate the bearish argument. That bearish argument has been in place since December with a portion of that retraced already. Now on the underside of price action, current support shown around 30 and a quarter. And this is one of those areas or one of those elements where it really looks as though this support had built in in anticipation of the deeper support level right up the 130 big fig. That 130 big fig was pretty elusive throughout last year. Notice that we came just like 15 pips from intersecting back in July came like 40 pips away here in a recurrent approach in late October. We finally saw price action push through on the final day of last year, but that's when selling pressure really, really dried up a week of range. And then similar to the US dollar, this thing snapped back. Now the big difference between dollar CAD and the dollar, the dollar, which we'll get a little bit more 
granular with here in a moment, is the fact that there hasn't been that forward stretch over the past week, right? As we have seen CAD strength roughly offsetting that USD strength, thereby leading to that middling range of 65 pips. It's been holding now for over a week. So below 130 and a quarter is the 130 big fig, and below that's 129.50. If 129.50 gets taken out, which I'm not expecting around tomorrow, but if it does, there could be a lot of room for this thing to fall. Uh, there is a Fibonacci level just about 25, 23 pips underneath around 29.27, 29.28. But then below that, there's pretty much a vacuum all the way down to 27.50-ish. Could fall really fast if that comes into play. But again, I'm not looking for that to take place tomorrow. For tomorrow, I'm just looking for a breach or or for some type of action outside of this box that's built in over the last week. That's so incredibly tight. Like I said, about 65 pips of range over the last week. Pretty impressive for just how unimpressive it has been. All right, going over to the dollar. So a similar backdrop here. Um, the dollar ended last year with some decent trend side run pushed down to a fresh five-month low on the final trading day of 2019, even held that theme on the first trading day of 2020. But since then, it's largely just been retracement of that prior short side theme. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, looked at the ascending triangle that had started to build in uh, higher lows coming in with a fairly consistent area of resistance as taken from prior support that runs around 97.05 up to about 97.20. These swing lows right in here. After a few different doses of resistance in the first week of, of 2020, topside break, pullback, supported prior resistance, and then prices have jumped right up to that next resistance zone. Now, the resistance zone that's in play right now does have a bit of history behind it. This is the 9770 price that I've been talking about for what feels like forever now. Uh, November of last year, or excuse me, 2018, this price came in to help hold, which was at the time the yearly high. Came back again in December. Last year in March, same. Another dose of resistance in June, even when we did get above, you know, kind of similar to what happened to dollar CAD sub 130, just that, that trend side pressure just dried up and then prices fall right back below. Even another recurrent approach, trend side pressure dries right up. Resistance comes right back in. Now we did catch a bit of support off of this zone in September of last year after another resistance inflection in early August. But that is what led into that fresh two-year high on the first trading day of Q4. This thing topped out literally on the first trading day of Q4. A very visible short side move priced in through the first half of October. Bit of resistance showing off that same familiar zone. And most recently, that zone came into play just before Christmas. This is what helped to hit that, uh, set that swing high um, just ahead of the Christmas holiday, just ahead of those fresh five-month lows. Now, price action has reverted right back to that point of resistance, and that's what marks the high from yesterday. Now, yesterday was a bit peculiar because it was uh, holiday-thin conditions. Uh, much of the United States or, or, or much of the banking sector of the United States was off on holiday in observance of Martin Luther King Day. So it's tough to know how much value to give this resistance inflection, given that it wasn't a fully staffed day across most banks here on Wall Street. Uh, what is notable, however, is as prices have pulled back from another attempt from that zone, we've gotten a fairly vigorous support response so far this morning as the buyers have jumped as buyers have jumped right back in. So Similar to what I was looking at last week, from swing approaches, this is likely going to look more attractive on the short side, looking at a hold of this resistance, given that we have a couple of swing points that are relatively nearby that could be used for stop placement. On a shorter term basis, it's likely going to be more attractive from the side of recent momentum, which has been a series of higher highs and higher lows, including very respectable support inflection off of prior resistance that showed just last week. That side would likely be looking for prices to break above that 97 to 97.86 resistance zone with the next major area of resistance looking to be around 98.33 up to around 98.50. Now, taking a step back to 
look at some some usable levels uh, beyond current resistance 98.33 98.50 beyond that the next big level that's looming on the charts is around 99 underneath current price action we have that same support zone that came into play last week 97.05 at around 97.20 below that really key level at 96.47 as this was the price that helped to stem that decline from that late year sell-off. This is the 23.6% Fibonacci retracement of this major move. 2011 low, 2016 swing high. The 23.6 is just setting right in there. And you can even see this off the weekly chart, all this posturing on these underside wicks. Is that what looks to be the level or the zone that finally helped to stem the bleeding from that Q4 sell-off? The big question is whether or not sellers have another round left in them, given that we've just had a snapback to a key zone of resistance. A key zone of resistance that is relevant on a near-term basis because that lines up very well with the 38.2 of that Q4 sell-off from the first day of Q4 to the final day of Q4. At the very least, that move is fairly clear. All right, so also on the range front, and this isn't that much more exciting, but Euro dollar. So the same levels that I looked at last week are still showing some element of inflection. Uh, the 1082 support level allowed for prices to dance a little bit higher. Resistance showed up shortly after a push above 1145. We didn't quite get to the big picture resistance zone of 1187 to 1212. Prices have flexed right back down to that 1082 price. And that comes in at a pretty notable Fibonacci level. <clears throat> this Fibonacci retrace could be found from this major move, taking the June 2019 swing high. Down to that October 1st Q4 open swing low. The 38.2 of that major move, it's pretty well worn at this point. Came in as resistance in November. Support in December, support again earlier this year, and then support again just yesterday. There's a bit of confluence just underneath current price action, though. You look at that swing low from, from mid uh, well, December 20th, not quite mid-December. We also have a bullish trend line projection. So there's there's quite a bit of fodder out there on the support side of the equation that could keep the door open for short-term swing strategies. I say short-term swing strategies because, again, we're largely looking at range or mean reversion, given that we haven't set a new high or a new low over the past few months. Euro price action has basically just been winding up tighter and tighter and tighter. Now it could break in one direction or the other at some point, and we do have an ECB rate decision on the cards for Thursday. But again, there's no signs yet that that might be creeping in at this point. So traders basically have the option either be patient and wait for this thing to break out and begin showing a trend or look to trade inside the cracks, basically looking to trade mean reversion or looking to trade uh, with a bit of range like backdrop. And in that case, a hold of support here could remain fairly attractive for top side swing strategies, looking for price to revert back towards that 1145 figure. At the very least, risk levels could be contained fairly nearby off that recent swing low. So if there isn't a hold of this support structure, then stops could be triggered relatively quickly with the goal of prioritizing loss mitigation. But there's not really a burgeoning trend showing yet. And so I think it's real important that traders adapt to the backdrop. The backdrop of lower volatility, slower moves, mean reversion, or just taking a seat on the sidelines and waiting for something to break. All right, something that might be a little closer to breaking. And Pete hit the nail on the head here around ECB. I, 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 the, the big thing around the European Central Bank is, is what happens to that presser. It's Christine Lagarde second at the bank. Her first, she seemed maybe a little bit nervous, or maybe that was just my interpretation given that I've been used to, I think it was like seven years, six years of Mario Draghi. Or was it eight? It might have been eight actual years. But yeah, I got so used to Mario Draghi that uh, it was just a little bit different. Um, but Thursday is going to be her second rate decision atop the bank. And, and this is one of those areas where she, she warned previously not to read too deeply into what she says. 
but that doesn't really seem the way that finance Twitter works. It seems that finance Twitter kind of reads too deeply into everything that everybody says. So that will be really interesting. Uh, one pair that does appear a bit closer to breaking in one direction or the other is uh, cable per pound against the US dollar. And had looked at this one last week. Last week, it looked like it was starting to break out of that bull pennant formation that's been holding for a little while now. But that point of resistance, the 3117, that held and prices reverted right back down below the 130 spot. Now, so far, we have seen a hold of that 2020 swing low that was set on Tuesday of last week. Notice that it was a slight higher low, but a higher low nonetheless. Buyers have come back into the fray. And I think what's notable here is if we look at this on a daily chart, then do like a little bit of comparison and contrasting amongst major pairs, right? Nice little dragonfly doji from yesterday, bullish candle so far today. But if we look elsewhere, like Euro dollar, Euro dollar is basically batting two dojis. All right, Aussie dollar, not bullish at all. Yesterday's doji, sell off today, fresh low. Even like Kiwi dollar, kind of the same. Sell off yesterday, spinning top today. So I think just comparatively, for amongst major pairs, this does put cable maybe in a slightly more attractive spot for those that are looking to sell USD off of that resistance. Still somewhat mired in the same backdrop where it's been digestion, congestion, not a lot of excitement showing of recent. But given that inflection off of 3117, there could be context for looking for that next move. Now, what traders looking on the long side of cable are likely going to want to look for is a top side breach through that swing high, at which point a pullback, looking for support around a prior level of resistance, could come back into play. And looking for bullish continuation strategies, taken with a break from this bull pinup formation that's now been brewing over about the past month. Cable topped out December 13th since then, and the low was set December 20th. Since then, it's basically just been winding up coiling, ready to break in one direction or the other. At this point, the, the closest clues would hint towards the long side of this, given that there has been a hold of trendline support, whereas last week brought a breach of trendline resistance, and we've had another one of those so far today. But still lower highs, coupled with higher lows. Hasn't yet thrown out a signal in either direction, but likely what this is going to need is a quick push up to a fresh higher high to reopen that door for bullish trend strategies. All right, on the exact opposite side of the US dollar, Aussie. So this one, fairly cut and dry. Uh, elongated downtrend, there's, and there's two of them really. One that peaked out here in January of 2018. And then another one that ran a lot more clean through last year from that top in December of 2018. Now, at the end of last year, as that dollar sell-off was really taken hold, you could see where short cover really created a counter trend move, a fairly aggressive counter trend move. This thing scaled above the 70 big fig, even opened the year above that level, held for a day. But what initially started off as a pullback, a pullback to support around prior resistance, 6930. And again, let me show you some reference for that level. There's 6930, October swing high. Good job of turning around in advance here in December. Good job of holding the highs later in the month. But that level came back in as support in that first, very first week of 2020. What changed here was the RBA, or at least market expectations around the RBA. Open of 2020, RBA comes out, opens the door to rate cuts. Now, at the very least, there's a central bank that will tip their hand or is open to tipping their hand in one direction or the other. In this case, the RBA talking up cuts, right? The Fed right now is still saying they're expecting to remain flat for, for the rest of this year. And then I believe they're looking at one hike next year in 2021. So it really seems as though the Federal Reserve is continuing to try to manage expectations through forward guidance. But at least the RBA has opened the door to that rate cut potential. So started looking for a reutilization of that prior resistance turn support as resistance again. And that showed up last week, last Thursday to be exact, held the highs. 
and prices are now pushing right back down to a fresh near-term low. So this could keep the door open for short side scenarios in Aussie dollar, particularly for those that are looking at ways of getting long in USD. If the US dollar does break out beyond that 97.70 resistance zone, looking for that next move up towards 98.33 to 98.50, the short side of Aussie is likely gonna remain as attractive or at least one of the more attractive candidates or vehicles for that long USD exposure. Now on the, the short side or the underside of price action, I looked at 68.50 for a potential support level last Thursday. That's now come back into play. Uh, below current prices, the next very obvious level would be around the 68 handle. And it could be a tricky one, given the way that this swing low had priced in just like right at the big fig. So this might be something where traders that are targeting or using targets around that zone want to nest it a little bit inside of the price, just in case we get a slightly higher low. Uh, below that, 67.50 is kind of a troubling area. I say kind of a troubling area. This was the flash crash swing low from last year. Did come back into play as support. That's right, right around 67.44. But then this swing low comes in around 67.55, just about 11 pips higher. So that could be relatively tricky. Um, longer term, however, and if, if the dollar does stage a big picture trend of strength, that 67 level is likely going to be a protuberance for a while. Uh, that level came into play August of last year. Notice sellers continued to press, continued to press, continued to press, and just could not break it. Pretty good study of higher highs and higher lows in here as well. After that last and final failed attempt in the opening days of Q4. But this will likely remain as one of the more attractive long USD candidates in the near term. All right, moving on. Uh, so this is the last dollar pair that I have on my radar for today. If there's any others that you have questions on, feel free to fire my way. I'll do my absolute best to help when we get to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Um, so what's notable about Sw the Swiss franc is Switzerland now is officially considered to be a currency manipulator. So the Swiss National Bank kind of got called out. Sure enough, you look at this recent price inflection coming off fresh yearly lows. At a relatively interesting support level as well. You look at this on like a weekly chart. Take this major move, December 2016 swing high, draw that down to the February 2018 swing low. That's that 38.2 retracement at 96.29. It came into play last week to help hold support right in there. It's notable, however, is the way that this resistance cover is beginning to show, uh, right inside of the 97 handle. Hourly chart, you can see where it looks as though it's starting to tip back over, recent lower low, it looks like there's a kind of an attempt or grasp, some lower highs here. So I think this one could be notable uh, for those that are looking short for short side USD strategies. Now, granted, this is one of those things where the Swiss National Bank could upset the apple cart very, very quickly and very, very easily. We've seen that before. Um, but given the current backdrop, this is one of the few current trends that I can find in major pairs. And it really seems as though Switzerland being called out as a Currency manipulator is, is, is what's helping to bring that push. Franc strength on the basis that the Swiss National Bank is not yet ready to step in and weaken the currency, i.e. manipulate the currency, at least per those claims per the, from the Treasury Department. Okay, moving away from FX, got a few uh, non-FX markets to look at. Gold. <clears throat> so my contention is that gold still that the big driver on gold still isn't ready yet. Look at this on the daily chart. It's still relatively messy. There are some relative uh, support levels nearby, but this isn't something that I think uh, Chasey would be warranted of yet or right now. So to my eyes, the big push point here on gold prices has been and remains to be the Fed, right? This syncs up very well with that Q4 sell-off that we saw in stocks. As fear was permeating the backdrop, gold prices began to rise again. And, and, and it seems 
relatively clear as to why, because the expectation for that pain in equity markets was for the Fed to get more loose and dovish. Now, they were pretty evasive about that topic last year. It wasn't until June of last year that the FOMC started to talk up rate cut potential, and that's when gold prices really started to fly all the way into September. Now, from September into mid-December, price action of gold basically just digested that prior gain, held above the 38.2% retracement of that summer breakout, thereby keeping the door open for bullish continuation potential. And then as we wound down 2019, opened the door to 2020, gold bulls came back with gusto yet again. What really added a lot of, a lot of kerosene to this fire was the threats between U.S. and Iran relations, the, the prospect of a World War III. That's what seemed to eventually bring capitulation into the mix. This thing got a little bit too hot to handle. Has pulled back, and we've seen since support hold. But again, it's one of those things where we don't know how much of this was fear and how much of this was expectations for the Fed to remain loose and passive. Likely there was a combination of the two that were doing the driving when prices were on the way up all the way until prices ticked over 1600 just a couple of weeks ago. So the shorter term we get, the messier it becomes, like hourly chart. Not a four hour, now the hourly, there we go. Now it's pretty jagged. So I think at this point, the more attractive way to move forward on, on gold is to spot support levels of interest and then wait to see if they might come into play Similar to what happened here around 1547 earlier this morning. A little bit deeper, 1535 remains of interest. 1528 could be a level to work with. This is simply the 50% marker of this most recent major move. Taking the November low, drawing that up to the January high. Notice that 38.2, that's what came in to help set support today, but just a little bit lower. There's another reference level with the 50% marker. Uh, even lower on price, that same 1515 resistance zone that did a really good job of holding the highs in October and November, even a pause point here in late December. This hasn't really been tested much for support yet, but that could even be expanded down to the 618 retracement of that recent major move to offer a zone, if you will. I'm looking for pullback potential. Uh, oil, WTI, there we go. Oil's held really well with a lot of these levels of, uh, that I've been looking at. So 59.64, that Fibonacci level helped to mark yesterday's or the Sunday open swing high. Um, recent support off 57.37, current resistance off a of prior swing low right around 58.65. Uh, these Fibonacci retracements appear to be continuing to show some value in green. I'm just basically looking at the Q4 2018 sell-off. goes from the October top down to the December low. In blue, with a lighter weight from that December low up to the April swing high. It was the 50% marker of the first Fibonacci retracement that helped to catch this week's swing high. It was the 38.2 of that secondary retracement that helped to catch last week's swing low. But similar to what we're seeing in a lot of other markets, that bandwidth is diminishing, getting smaller. The range is tightening. It doesn't mean it's going to last forever, but it does mean you can't trade for breakouts or fresh trends until those new lows or those new highs begin to show or form. And we just simply haven't had that yet. So that's what I'm looking at in oil. Uh, Want to start taking some questions, so let me know what's on your mind. Michael Carberry, hi James, hope you're well. Um, what's your thoughts of a sell-off pound CAD to support uh, 169.55 and sell the head and shoulders euro dollar on the four-hour chart? So pound CAD, I'd be hard pressed to work with at the moment um, because of those Canadian drivers that are coming out tomorrow. Let me take a quick look via price action to see what I might be able to to set up here. Yeah, respectable hold of support. There's the 69.55 level. So 
so the the CAD portion of this, you know, it does does have some complications. Um, from a pure price action standpoint, this is one that I might be following for some strength to come into play. Uh, reason being, the first thing that jumps out at me when I look at this on like a daily chart is a very respectable level of support that's been helping to hold the lows. Okay, so it doesn't quite have that, it, it hasn't quite built as a descending triangle, but it has some of that tonality where there's a firm horizontal level of support combined with these lower highs that have been coming into play on a more near-term basis. You can see those lower highs maybe starting to give way or breach. Like I would basically just want to see prices burst back above that swing high around 7107 to give me the idea that that big picture support zone had held the lows and the prices might soon be able to tick higher. I feel like I have a, a better feel for fundy themes in the British pound than I do on the CAD at the moment, you know, because CAD's kind of been rangy against a lot of other, against a lot of other major currencies, whereas the British pound at the very least has shown um, some tonality for trend of recent. That Canadian batch of uh, headline risk tomorrow. Could be problematic though. Um, Euro dollar. So, let me take a quick look because I didn't see a head and shoulders there myself. I mean, I, I guess I could kind of fit one in there, but you know, given what I'm seeing on longer term charts, it, it, it kind of feels as though I'd be, um, you know, trying to see a sign where something doesn't actually exist because here on the weekly. You know, it's it's really kind of middling, low volatility type of backdrop. So maybe there's a formation inside of that noise, but it's not something I want to get too excited about at this point. I'll instead just be trying to trade this horizontally, trading the range until the range finally breaks. It could be a tricky one. Hey, Patrick, good to see you, my friend. Hey, Pete, good to see you, buddy. Uh, this is Sean Lloyd. Hey, James, I know you've been uh, trading longer than I have. Perhaps you were trading when the SARS outbreak happened in 2002, 2003. What do you think of this new uh, coronavirus outbreak going on in China, its effect on markets? Pretty scary stuff, you know, but I think that uh, I'm pretty much with everybody else on that one. Um, you know, this is one of the reasons that I love price action so much, because it'll tell me what's important what isn't you want to need to follow them what i don't and at this point i just haven't really seen much of that show up in price action yet like earlier today when i was kind of doing a recap of what took place yesterday when i was off the desk and not really paying attention to markets at all um you know the first thing that jumped out at me is is what a lot of folks were attributing to gold you know that there was a quick run of safe haven flows on this uh the expansion of this virus um I'd be very cynical in assigning that quick jump followed by that quick pullback to that specific driver. Cause I mean, again, there's just so many things going on right now. Um, but I think I'm like everybody else and that I just really hope it all turns out for the best and really hope that it's something that I don't have to worry about uh, here in New York um, ever. But uh, from a trading perspective, I'm sorry, I don't really have much special insight. I basically need a market to break first before I can look to do anything um, with that theme or with that move. And I just simply haven't seen any breaks around uh, US or domestic markets that I can work with yet. Uh, from Pete, DXY confirmed three touches. Was that on the 9770? It's got a few more than that on 9770. It's been pretty, pretty busy around that zone. Um, there was definitely three touches off that 9705, 9720 before it broke out. Beautiful little pullback support right or prior resistance. I mean, that thing had a lot of good things going for it last week. You know, but again, as, as I was talking about in last Thursday's webinar, you know, these aren't super exciting moves because they are measured, they are tighter in comparison to the moves that we were seeing even just a couple of months ago, which was also a low, vol low vol backdrop at the time. But all big things have small beginnings. And uh, it's usually when we're in these low vol backdrops that 
you know, some type of black swan shows itself. Something unexpected. Uh, for Pete, how the false breaker follow through Euro may drive dr may drive it on Thursday. It, you know, it's possible for sure. You know, I'm certainly not unique in the fact that I'm not looking for anything groundbreaking at that event. So, if, you know, if we do see something unexpected or if we hear something uh, unexpected, then, yeah, sure, there could be a whole range of possible outcomes. Just nothing reflected in price action yet, so there's not really a whole lot I could do on that theme. Um, on the top side, and I've looked at this scenario before on these webinars where on the top side, if I am going to look for, you know, that big picture breakup in the euro, then I'm basically going to need this thing to push through 1250 first. After push through 1250, I have a decent little secondary resistance zone. I could look for prices to rest in, at which point I could then look to play pullbacks. But, you know, even, even that doesn't appear ready to cook yet. It feels like it needs to marinate for a little while longer. Yeah, these levels go back to 19, summer of 19 and before. Well. <laughs> uh, Gary D. Well, I would say, and this is in reference to Miss Christine Lagarde, she will learn just like Jay Powell did. There's a difference in that, you know, in Europe, because there's, you know, numerous sovereign economies represented by that one central bank you know there isn't the you know kind of that uh kind of that big boss factor that Jerome Powell has in the U.S. where he basically works for the president you know it'd be hard it'd be hard to imagine um European politicians getting on Twitter to blast Miss Lagarde at least to the same degree that we've seen Trump and Powell in that tango Okay, quite a few questions here on yen pairs. Yeah, I, so I noticeably left these off today, and apologies to uh, anybody that was looking for yen pairs. I just don't really know what to do with them. Um, from a price action perspective, the look is very, very boring, but it's more or less look for a support hold around prior resistance, 109.66. That 109.66 price, uh, it gave numerous dashes of resistance when prices were on the way up. Good job holding early December, one, two, three, four more later in the month until prices finally resisted again a week and a half ago before breaking out. Hasn't yet been tested for support. Um, so a pullback to that level with a show of buyers could reopen the door for topside strategies. Even then, though, there's a lot of different potential resistance levels sitting just overhead. And I mean, this comes fresh after a failure from bulls to continue to drive last week. I mean, prices were setting perched above that 110 psychological level. Buyers had every opportunity in the world to push things home, and they didn't. Uh, we have to ask ourselves as to why. You know, so if it finds support around prior resistance, maybe there's something there for a quick swing to work with. But, um, you know, again, just not a lot that was striking my fancy on this one earlier today. Um, a few other questions on Euro Yen. I did look at Euro Yen in this week's forecast. Give me a quick second. I'll be happy to share that with anybody so interested. And I think for those that are looking at ways to get short of the euro, euro yen could be more interesting. As it at the very least offers somewhat of that confinement perspective. Where price action is getting more and more and more confined within a wedge formation. This wedge has been brewing for a while now, much last year. Um, but resistance came into play last week. We looked at this on the webinar. Resistance has so far or since held. Quick swing high last Friday. Continued drive so far today. So that could be a more exciting way for somebody that is looking to get short side exposure in the euro. Uh, pound yen, a little more problematic because we do have a hold. And that goes, there just goes my notepad. Um, we do have a hold of that key resistance level around 143.79. At the very least, there has been a bit of a bullish bias that have been, that's been trickling in here, kind of owed to what I was talking about a little earlier um, in response to pound CAD. But there's been a little bit of a bullish bias in the British pound, which, given the lack of bias is shown elsewhere, it's really noticeable. Um, but that could be workable or usable for those that are looking to get on some topside exposure in pound yen. Hold of 
higher level support, maybe off that trend line, it's showing right in here. There we go. Maybe off something like that. You know, I wouldn't quite call this an ascending triangle, but it, 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 it has some kind of qualities of that. Decent little horizontal resistance. Sold a couple of different inflections so far in the new year. Buyers getting more and more anticipatory. Could be something to work with there. At the very least, maybe there's a way to maybe hedge around the yen. Synthetic play in Euro pound, something like that. Uh, from Pete, Aussie looking anemic compared to his Kiwi cousin. It is, yeah. That Aussie turn happened real, real viciously. It went from like extreme strength to extreme weakness like that. The turning of the page into the new year. All right, got to take the last couple questions of the day. Um, Joshua Loveless, how far could you potentially see dollar yen falling if the epidemic in China continues? And at what point could you start, uh, uh, could could it start spiraling as it looks like it's about ready to fall? I mean, as far as projections are concerned, I mean, 100 is not out of the realm of, of, of question if this is an actual pandemic. I mean, again, I really hope that it isn't. I really hope that it isn't. But you know, as the old saying goes, up the stairs and down the escalator or elevator, I guess depending on the type of building you live in. Um, when when fear comes into the backdrop to do the driving, it could get really bad really fast. We're just, you know, again, we're just not quite there yet, given current price action. Um, longer term support levels, you know, we have this batch from 2016. That's right around the 100 spot. But there's even some deeper reference here, like before Abinomics came into play, that support was around 75 and change. You know, so I hope these aren't, I hope these aren't scenarios that we're dealing with in the near term. But you know, again, if things go awry or if 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 uh, risk goes off very badly, then that's not out of the realm of possibility. I'm just not seeing it yet off current price action because off the daily, this looks like basically just a pullback from fresh highs at least at this point. And again, I hope it stays that way. Uh, from Pete, risk off is growing a little momentum as US equities come off and yen strength catches a bid. Yeah, I mean, this thing is still really high up there in the ether. Another fresh all time high on Friday. A little pullback to open today, and, and it looked like that was, you know, on the basis of fears around what's going on in China. But much of that's already been clawed back. So there could be some backdrop for it. Let's look at Yen on like an hourly chart. Yeah, and just dipping its toe into the water. But nothing broken yet. Okay, so for the last one of the day, I see that there are like four questions on Pound Swiss. So let's do that. Um, so kind of going back to the fundamental aspect of this, I do think that these are both currencies where there could be a, a case made for strength. Um, on the side of the British Pound, we're going to have Brexit Day at the end of this month. So there's an official date that's actual, actually set which has generally been looked at as a positive driver in the currency. On the franc side of the matter, we have seen a continuation of franc strength, even as uh, as Switzerland was called out as a currency manipulator. Switzerland being called out as a currency manipulator is likely going to make it a bit more difficult for them to artificially weaken the currency through sterilized or non-sterilized interventions. And I think that's what helps to put even more focus on the long side of the franc. Now, with that said, those two individual currencies kind of run counter to each other if we are going to see strength on on either side of the coin right normally i want to get deviation where i'm marrying up a really strong currency with a really weak currency so maybe if the swiss national bank comes back with you know some type of intervention efforts 
you know, maybe the top side of the pair could get attractive again. Uh, more near term. Here, let's chart this up. Let's see if we can find some uh, usable levels of recent context. Feel a little oversold right now. There's a big zone of resistance here. There's a big zone of resistance here that's taken from a prior support area. This is what's what's currently helping to hold the offer. You see right in there. All right, but geez, each of these resistance inflections has carried a little less weight. So it looks like something that wants to show a topside breakout at some point. That would still be a corrective move though. Like if we do get that topside push up to a fresh, which would amount to basically just a weekly high. Uh, there are a few other stumbling blocks sitting not too far away, uh, key of which runs right around 127.50. Another potential area around 26.87. On a longer term basis, I just don't like the fact that I'm that there's there's a backdrop for strength in each of these individual currencies. It, it makes it a little tougher to argue for uh, directional runs in a currency pair when, when there's a somewhat strong backdrop behind each of those. Um, but that, my friends, is what I have for today. I want to say thank you so much, everybody, for your time. I'll be back on Thursday, and uh, we'll be able to look at price action after the ECB, after that batch of Canadian risk tomorrow morning. Uh, as usual, thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.